with it. So it, we had uh, uh, a very basic problem for us to get going um, on looking at the internal forces. We've looked at, well, we, we quickly looked at the internal forces when we were looking at struts and structures and machines and like, because we were finding out just that if, uh, if a particular member was in uh, tension or compression, but uh, we're stepping beyond that now because now we're looking as well at whatever shear there might be in the um, member. In fact, we, a lot of these problems, we don't have any tension or compression in the member at all. It's all shear or bending moment. So we had this problem. And we've just gotten through going for uh, through all the parts uh, finding the moment and the shear for each section. Actually that wasn't the letters I used because we labeled these points just for reference. So that was the reaction. We had we had those reactions. I think this was 5.5. Is that right? And this one was 6.5. Okay. And then we looked at the um, Shear in uh, the shear in the moment in uh, in a bunch of different sections and found it to be a little bit different in each one. I think uh, I think we had the shear as uh, 5.5 kips here, and the moment was how much? Five 5.5 x I think it was. Yeah. that depended upon the location of, of our imaginary cut. Remember we were taking an imaginary cut and that way we could expose those internal forces and then calculate what they were going to be. Um, then for the next section, what did the shear come out to be there? 3.5 and the moment was 3.5x plus 8. 3.5x plus 8 and that's six feet. And then the next section had a shear of 2.5 and the moment was 2.5 negative 2.5x is that right plus 56 That's and then huh let's get the uh get the yeah thanks and then we had the last section. Um, and that was a uh, shear of 6.5. And the moment was negative 6.5x plus 104. Oh, uh, tips, Okay, so that's, that's just the summary of what we had. And uh, clearly, uh, there's some interplay going on between these. It uh, doesn't seem to work out perfectly. Um, uh, it, stuff is a function of x. Every time we went to a different section, we got a different shear, a different moment. 
So there's a, a dependence upon x. Not there, clearly there is one with the moment because it acts right in there. But shear depends upon where we are in the beam as well. Also, and, and Alan, I think, tweaked on this early Monday anyway, appears to be some relationship between the shear and the moment as well because that number keeps reappearing. 5, 5, 5, 5, 3, 5, 2, 5. Well, we have a minus there, so we have to think about whether there really is a relationship between those two. But what we can do now is actually graph these values and visually see what's going on with these uh, different things. So we can put the, the shear first and it's nice to line it up right under the free body diagram because these values depended upon what was going on in the beam. We broke it into sections every time the, the load changed. Every time the load changed, we changed sections and we found different values each time. So it's nice if we look and see what's going on here. So let me, let me move that out of the way a little bit. So we've got the, the shear here in kips as a function of position along the beam. And we happen to do it from the left end, but it shouldn't matter. That's not going to change what the forces are. So let's see. In the first section, we had a shear of 5.5. So we can, we can graph that. And it was constant all the way across there. That's pretty easy to do. Then in the second check section, we had a shear of 3.5. So we drop down a little bit here to 3.5. Now the next one was 2.5. However, maybe you're starting to think, well, wait a second, there's clearly a relationship between the values of the shear, not only the values of the shear, but the jump in the shear graph each time we had a force. Uh, before the beam even starts, of course, we don't have any shear. Then all of a sudden, we jumped up 5.5. And that's exactly what the load was right there. That's what the reaction was. We jumped up 5.5. Then we hit this down load of 2. And we went down 2. Now we have a down load of 6. But we don't go down 6. So either this relationship between the shear and the loads doesn't hold, or we need to come to some new understanding to make this work out. You'd think, gosh, if we jump down, if we jump down two here and that works so well, why don't we jump down six here, down to here somewhere? Well, what is a jump of six down from 3.5? negative 2.5 so maybe this should be negative which might help us because we had 5 5 5 5 3 5 3 5 2 5 negative 2 5 that might fix that so let's see let's see first let's go to let's go to this section just real quick and review how we got those numbers so there's our imaginary cut there's the 5.5 reaction we had there. We have this, this uh, two kip load coming down. All right, so we're, we're just looking at, uh, at this second section here between four and eight. And we had, uh, clearly we had a moment or a, a, a uh, shear that was down, right? 
because we've got 5.5 up and we need 2.5 down. That's how we got the 3.5 in there that we had. And then we also had moment going that way. Then in the next section, we still have the 5.5 five up here. We still have two down there, and now we have six down. Now we're, we're reviewing this section. Now we have, let's see, we had eight down, five, five up. Now we needed a shear that was up before we needed a shear that was down. So these two shear values are in opposite directions. So if we call this one positive, we better call this one negative because we need to illustrate somehow it's in a completely different direction. It could be we need to know that for the design of the beam. We need to know which direction the shear is. So we better say this is negative 2.5. We better make a negative in here. A pink negative. Because it's not just the NFL that goes pink. I can go pink too. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to have that convention. Uh, if we have any section of a beam and the shear is down there. Uh, the opposite of that would be up on that side. Because we could have done this, this examination with these fake cuts we're putting through the beam from the other side. Uh, this will be our convention for positive shear. And we we pretty much stumbled upon that anyway. We just didn't notice it as we were going. We didn't notice that the shear had switched direction there. Now that jump down of six matches the shear we were getting. So we'll go down six to the 2.5. Hard to make things right good to scale. So this is minus 2.5 there for the shear. Now we probably feel a little better. Now these match like they did on the other ones. That's kind of that's comforting. Here as we head into the holiday season. And the stress is building. When am I going to get Manning for Christmas? That would be something nice. Because I need a letter of reference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, go back to the picture on this one. Should this shear be negative? Was the shear up for this last section? And it, yeah, it was too. So this should also be negative and matches our convention now. Also, um, it matches our jump down of four. Oh, and then notice we're now at 6.5 minus 6.5, and it even matches the jump up we have to do to get to the end of the beam where there is no shear with the uh, with the reaction at the end of the beam there. So now we've got this nice graph that shows us what the shear is what direction it's in, and how it varies with position. And we can see a couple things. Uh, uh, everywhere there was no load change, there was no uh, change in the shear. So we can use that. We can use that in future times. If we don't have any load change, and we know the shear at one point, we know it for the rest of the point in that section until the load changes again. Alan? It looks like just by 
looking at it quickly visually that it represents it kind of represents the moment of the whole thing too because the forces are well forces on the let's right. let's and get to there in a minute and see see what the relationship is between these things we also notice now that when there's a jump change in the shear it's directly due to a point load by the same magnitude that jump right there was two down the jump right here was six down here four down that's a little out of scale and then even the 6.5 back up to finish so that's that's kind of helpful it's uh, it's helpful to understand how the load affects the shear graph it's also useful to have this graph because now we can very quickly look and see where's our place of maximum shear well it's it's clearly right here that whole section is in danger of of shear failure if any place is because that's where the maximum shear is so we've got this nice shear graph the shear uh, diagram that we can we can draw for ourselves and we can do the same kind of thing with the moment diagram so let's see how that shakes out so here's the moment in Kip's foots and let's see what we've got uh, where does the graph start we're right at this end of the beam remember that was a simple pin support how much moment does a pin support exert? None. So there shouldn't be any moment in the beam here at this end because uh, there's nothing to cause any moment right there. So we're going to start at zero. And we could figure that out anyway. We could do a imaginary cut through the beam that is infinitesimally small. X is essentially zero. And we've got the reaction up 6.5, uh, 5.5. We've got to have shear down of 5.5. And uh, we've, we've got, remember, shear down on that side is our positive shear. So that all matches. But since we're barely into the beam, essentially x equals zero, then these two don't really form a couple. They're just equal and opposite forces there, and there is no moment. So that makes sense then. At this free end, at this end of the beam, where it's just a pin support, there's nothing causing it to bend right there. Not yet. We have to start getting into the beam a little bit. We need a little bit of x there. So we can start getting a couple that the internal moment of the beam must resist. So it makes good sense physically and just, uh, uh, I don't know, commonsensically that, that that should be zero. So we're, we're, oh, plus if x equals zero, duh, there we go. <laughs> Why did anybody mention that? It's right there. But then there's, there's what our moment graph does from then on. It goes 5.5x. Um, that's uh, a slope with an intercept of zero. My gosh, it's all coming together beautifully here for us. So, so it's, a, it's a straight line with a slope of 5.5. Where does that make us end up? What's the moment value right here? After going up at 5.5 kips per foot, I guess. Because this is, this is the slope, and the slope's that over that. So it's actually kips. So we, we go over uh, four feet, we're going to go up how much? 
22. So that takes us to 22. So now we, we're getting this idea too, if we're worried about bending failure, because the moment trying to bend the beam, things are worse a little bit into the beam than they are at the ends. So maybe we can save a little bit on the beam design there and not worry too much about the ends. Uh, start beefing things up in the center of the beam. Let's see what happens next. Uh, then we do, 3.5x plus 8. So the slope is easy, but that intercept, I don't know what that means. So the intercept's 8, the slope's 3.5. Um, but we can do this. Figure out what the moment is right at the 4 feet. That'll tell us what we do next after this graph. So 3.5 times 4 plus 8 is is what? 22. 22. So we don't have a discontinuity here. We continue where we were before at a slope of 3.5. So that was 5.5. Maybe that's 3.5 and that intercept then is 8. But we, we, we don't need that other than to line the, the graph up. But we were able to do without it because we could figure out what the moment is before and after. So now where do we end? So at 8 feet, just put 3.5 times 8 plus 8, we end where? 36. So that's 36. So now we know if we're worried about this thing failing because of internal moment from bending, I'm more worried about here than I am back here. All right, so then we got to see what do we do next. So now we're at 8 feet minus 2.5 times 8 plus 56. It's 36. Yeah, so right where we left off, that's good. That makes it a lot easier than trying to figure out where the intercept is. And then we go down minus 2.5. So that was 3.5. This is minus 2. Point. So it's not quite as steep. We go down a little bit. And end up where? Because now we're at 12 feet. So minus 2.5 times 12 plus 56 is... Huh? 26. 26. So we're right here and we're at 26. And now we do the last section. So now we're at 12 feet minus 6.5 times 12 plus 104. I'm starting to suspect it might be 26. I'm putting my money down. I put my money down there. Oh, but now we got to do this. Uh, slope is minus 6.5. Where does that bring us? So do minus 6.5 at the end at the 16 feet plus 104. And then say it so quietly I can't hear it and have to ask you to say it louder. That's what he did every single time, didn't he? Yes. He did. Zero. Ah! <laughs> so, so we start at 26, we go down at 6.5, and we end at zero. Should we end at zero? Remember what the support was there? It was just the roller support. They, they don't support any moment. There can't be any moment left in the beam. And so everything matches. All the moment equations all matched everywhere we went along. And now we know now we know just where the maximum moment is. We know how much it is. If, if the beam we're designing can only withstand, say, uh, 25 kip feet of internal moment, then we know we better beef the 
center of the beam up and maybe we can save a little bit of money, a little bit of weight and leave the ends alone. And that could be maybe we have a, a simple beam and we weld some extra plates on here in the center there, bolt them on or glue them on, whatever it, whatever it takes. So, so we're getting some understanding here of the relationship. It appears that the slope of the moment curve is equal to the shear at the same spot. Shear, slope, shear, slope. Now we got this corrected, shear, slope, shear, slope. So we've got that. Let's, uh, let's, let's write that down somewhere. That seems to be pretty darn helping. What? The shear is the slope of the moment curve. Oh, but wait, something else follows from that. If that's true, then this is true. And that's, well, we can integrate that from one x to another, which is pretty darn easy. We've got a bunch of one x's to another right there, so that's, a, that's an easy integral to do. This is an integral just from m1 to m2. What's that integral become? This left-hand side. Not, not m, because it's between the limits, becomes, yeah, delta m. So this becomes delta, the change in moment from one spot to another is equal to, what's that? That's, no, no, because v, v is constant here, but maybe it isn't always. What is this in general? This is the area under the shear graph. Happens to be constant in this example, but we're going to find very quickly it's not always. So we know, well, let's see, area under Vx between the same two points. So let's test drive that. First section here, we know the moment changes from 0 to 22. What's the area under the shear graph in that same section? 5.5 times 8. What? 5.5 times 8? Times 4. No, uh, sorry, times 4, yeah, yeah, times 4. 5.5 times 4 is 22. So the area there is the change in moment. Uh, we went from 22 to 36, which is 14. What's 3.5 times 4? We go from 3.6, we go minus 10. What's 2 point, minus 2.5 times 4? Minus 10. It's working out perfectly. Dare we go one more? <laughs> minus 26. Minus 6.5 times 4. Minus 26. So, so we now have these two relations. I don't need the middle one because we can condense it to... See, we have this first one we just got that the shear is equal to the slope. And now we have the delta m equals the area under the vx curve between the same two points. <coughs> Excuse me. Delta m between two points, the area under the curve between the same two points. And you could even pick any two points on here and, and test that. You'd come up with that. So that's pretty helpful. I learned. So let's see, let's see what else we can come up with by going to some different uh, loads. This is very simple. It's a nice simple load, I mean nice simple beam with a couple point loads. So 
let's uh, let's just ramp it up a little bit and see what happens next. So, yeah, the change in moment is negative. So is this a magnitude thing, right? I mean, this only works with the magnitude. No, it works. The direction worked too. When the shear was negative, then the area is negative, and the delta m was negative. That's what we just had here, right? You don't really have negative areas there. Yeah. Area below the graph is negative area. Below the okay, axis. Okay, look at the area on the graph below. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Area below the axis right. we consider yeah. negative. Now let's look at the wrong graph. You'll need that for thermo, too. So get that into your heads. We also need that area above the axis, but going, integrating the other direction is also negative. Oh man, now you're excited about thermal. Okay, so let's do this. Our next beam, only slightly more complicated. Uh, still same support at either end, so I'll go right to the free body diagram. We know that, that uh, we'll have supports up like that. And a, a uniform distributed love. You know, just some bunch of, maybe some books on a shelf. Could be as simple as that. All right, so let's put a number, to, let's see, W here. Remember, the, this is the equation for the load curve, but it's constant in this example. Four kilonewtons per meter. And the beam is seven meters. So what are the reactions? How much? No. 14. Remember, this is the load distribution. So the total load is the area under the load curve, which is uh, uh, 28, so it's 14 each. 14 uh, kilonewtons, 14 kilonewtons. Okay. So uh, this is a little bit different. So let's redo this like we did before. We'll put in our imaginary cut out to some point X. Just like we did before, just we have a distributed load now instead of a point load. We've got still a distributed load there of four kilonewtons per meter. And now we're at some arbitrary point x meters. Oh, we have the reaction here, 14. Is there any shear? Remember, we've, we've now had this imaginary exposure, and we need to see what is the force on our leftover section from the section it's actually attached to that puts the whole thing in equilibrium. So is this in equilibrium? I don't know, let's see. The load down is how much? We got 14 up. How much is down? 4x. 4x. Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on just where we are. So we'll uh, we'll say it's because uh, the farther we get into the beam, the greater the downward load is. So the shear is 4x. Kilonewtons. It varies with position because so does the load. So the load changes uh, with every step along. Um, now, uh, how much moment though? We'll draw it that way. 
because that's the way we were doing it before. Oh, by the way, what we didn't come up with is uh, our convention for what's positive and negative on moment. Shear is positive if like that. Right? That's what we just came up with. Uh, moment. Let's see. Uh, we had we had moment like this everywhere, and it was positive everywhere. So that'll be our convention for positive moment. That's easy to remember because it'll make the beam smile. And it makes you smile too. Ah. Yep. What, why would the shear be like 14 minus 4x kilonewtons? Because 4x is the force down, so would the shear be the difference between the two of them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, these two are. So it's got to be equal to the up plus the down uh, kil kilonewtons. Minus, right? Wouldn't it be the way I drew it? Yes. Yeah, if x is 0, the shear's got to be 14 because we're right there at the end. So that makes sense. And then, and then if we go out, let's test it. If we go out to 7, then what? Be minus 14. And remember, we finished this graph by coming up the amount of the reaction, so that would make sense again, too. So we're, that, that looks like that's, uh, that might be pretty, uh, pretty useful, uh, pretty accurate. Uh, what about the moment? How do we figure out the moment now here, this internal moment? So it should be over now 4x minus 14. Oh. It'll come out the same way, right? I mean, if you just negate it, then it just depends on the sign of the way that you get. That could be it. We, the, I drew it down. So it must be equal to anything that's up. Here, remember, we, we always do everything down equals everything up. So the up part is 14. It must equal the down part, which is 4x, 14x, uh, plus v. So v equals 14 minus 4x. Right, that's just the sum of the forces. All the up stuff equals all the down stuff. And then solving for the V that we're looking for. So that 14X is, uh, is okay. Uh, all right, so, but how do we find the moment? Because we've, we've got these two forces, but they're not a couple. Because they're not equal and uh, opposite in magnitude, separated by some distance. Because there's also this going in. So how do we figure out how much moment is there? Well, we have to do it this way. Here's our little section of beam. We know we've got that. That's 14 kilonewtons. That's a reaction. That's always there. We know we've got this shear here of V equals 14 minus 4X. And we need to figure out how much moment is also caused by this distributed load. But we don't know how to figure out moment due to distributed load. So we replace it with the equivalent single point load through the centroid of the area, which is what we just spent a week learning. And now we can figure out the moment contribution 
of the distributed load and how that affects the total moment internally in the beam there. How big is this? It's 4x. So now for the purposes of moment, we treat it as a point load. So now we can sum the moments. So uh, we'll, we'll, let's sum them about, no, let's sum them about here because that's where x is measured from. It's just a lot less chance of uh, getting a, a, a cross-pollination between the equations. That's the term. All right, so, so sum the moments about, uh, I guess that's point A. And all the clockwise ones equal the usual thing. So we're here. We've got now a moment caused by this one that's um, a clockwise type moment. How big is that? It's what? 4x, 4x times its moment arm, x again, so it's 4x squared. Wait, I mean, that's half x. Would it be x over 2? Uh, sorry, yeah, x over 2, because we're halfway. x over 2. Then there's the moment caused by the shear, which is 14 minus 4x times a full x. And that's in the same direction. 14 minus 4x times its moment arm, x. Must equal the moment as I've drawn it, which is the other way. So we can, we can clean that up a little bit. 2x squared minus 4x squared, right? Minus 4x squared is a minus 2x squared total. Is that right? Um, plus 14x equals m. Is that right? I do that okay? Uh, kilonewton meters. I do that okay? Think? Okay. And, oh, that's good for the whole beam because nothing changes. The, the load doesn't change anywhere between 0 and 7. And if the load doesn't change, that equation is not going to change, and that equation is not going to change. So we can graph these now. So we'll graph the shear as a function of x. And see what it looks like. We have our equation for the shear. It's right here. So at x equals 0, the shear is 14, which is just what we had before where the shear graph starts with a jump equal to the reaction. So we start up 14. Because that's, that's what the reaction does forces the shear graph up 14. Then what? Then, oh, this is a straight line with a slope of minus 4 and an intercept of 14. So there's our intercept of 14. We have a slope of minus 4. So it's a lot easier to draw a straight line if you just have the two points. So what's the shear when x equals 7 at the other end of the beam? We know it's a straight line between there, so let's just find where we end up and draw the straight line. Negative 14. 
Oh, well, that makes sense too, because that's the reaction that we finish with. And there's a straight line in between there. So it looks like that. So if we're worried about shear failure, it's going to happen at the end, it's not in the middle. In fact, in the very middle of the beam, there is no shear. You could hold that with a band-aid. Good enough? Everybody comfortable with that? Just just graphing the shear thing that we found there, so it worked out pretty nice. So now the moment, let's do it. Kilonewton meters. And we've got the equation for the moment too. What is it at x equals zero? Zero which makes sense because that end is just freely pinned. There shouldn't be any moment there, so that makes sense. The equations matching uh, our expectation from the physics. So we're there. Uh, what moment will we finish with at seven meters? Minus two times 49 is minus 94 plus 14 is plus 94. Zero. Is that right? Is that how yeah, so we which makes sense because that was just a, a that was just the roller there, so there wouldn't be any moment in the beam there. And um, what's it do in between? Well it it's it's a quadratic in between. X squared, uh, concave down. Um, and uh, well, we can figure out what the maximum is. I guess that would help us a little bit. What's the value of the moment in the middle at 3.5? BJ, you quitting? You giving up? You boycotting? Pay was too low? For all that work? I don't blame you. Twenty-four and a what? Half. And is the maximum right there in the middle? Well, it's quadratic. We know those two points. It doesn't do anything else. It's it's got to have that maximum in the middle. And in fact, we can draw it in. And it was what? Twenty-four and a half. Chip uh, or kilonewton. Now, does that match what we had here? Is the slope of the moment graph equal to the shear at any point? Um, well, we could take the derivative of the moment. I want to take a second to do that. dm dx equals minus 4x is that right? Plus 14. Well, that's exactly the, the shear curve. So we don't even have to do it at any points. It's exactly what the shear curve is. So it doesn't matter if this is a constant or an equation. It still works. It worked perfectly. And the delta, well, let's do the delta M. Uh, we know from here, to here it went up 24.5. What's the area between those same two points? So 1 half times 3.5 times 14. Hopefully it's 24 and a half. It's beautiful. It's genius. Let's see. What else we got? We got anything else that came out here? Oh, we do. We do. We have another thing here. There's the load curve. In this case, it just happens to be a constant. Notice that the load curve is the slope of the shear curve. Oh no, minus the slope of the shear curve. The load curve 
is minus the slope of the shear curve. At least that's what appears to be the case, which is why I wrote it down in chalk, not in ink. Did you write it down in ink? No. Well, let's see. Hey, we just we just did uh, we did this problem a second ago. We had a reaction here, and then a point load there, and then some other things, and the shear curve looked like. Let's see, it was, it was constant, and then it jumped down by that amount, and then it was constant. Is that right? What's the load curve between these points? Not only constant, but zero. There is no load between there. We have a point load there, and a point load here, and nothing else in between. So the slope of the shear is zero just like the load curve is zero there. The value, the, the, the actual value of the load curve. What we don't know yet is, is this true for a, uh, a something other than a constant load curve? Because that's all we've done so far. But it sure came out that the load is minus the slope of the shear. Which also means, of course, then, that the change in the shear between any two points will be equal to what? Bring the dx over then integrate both sides, just like we did when we got here, but we just have a minus sign in, so it would be minus the area of the load curve. Now, that's in chalk, not in ink, so let's check it. Change in shear, let's see, we went from 14 to 0. What's the area minus the area of the load curve between those same two points? Four times three and a half is fourteen and a negative. We dropped in shear from here to here. And we can do it from there to there, or all the way across, or anywhere else in between. So now we have these four great relations that help us. All of this based upon just these conventions of what's positive, what's positive, neg what's negative. And it makes sense, uh, you know, the load down, that sounds like a positive load. That's what most loads do. So that's why the negative sign here, because uh, it just makes everything else match. Oh man, that's beautiful. And so we'll do some harder ones. Because we, we, we need to throw in a non-constant distributed load, see what that does. We haven't got an applied moment yet. We've got a couple applied forces, but not an applied moment yet. So we have to see what that does as well. So that's Friday, for those of you who plan on coming. Maybe I'll take it, maybe I'll. It's going to be one of the best days ever.